Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the limit definition of area. And so previously we discussed how to approximate the area under a curve or under a function like we have here using rectangles by a method known as Riemann sums. And so the formula we used to calculate that area was that the area was equal to the sum from i equals 1 to n, the number of rectangles that we're using, of the function evaluated at x sub i, which represents the height of our rectangles, and that's multiplied by delta x, which represents the width of our rectangles. And so if we wanted to know the area under this curve, or this function right here, f of x equals x cubed from 0 to 2, so that means we'd be looking at the interval from 0 to 2, we would have found this area by using a certain amount of rectangles n. And so if n was equal to 2, our rectangles would look like this. We would have a rectangle here and a rectangle here. And so we would use these two rectangles by calculating each of their area using this formula to approximate this shaded region underneath this curve here. And so now obviously this would be an approximation because when calculating the area of these rectangles, we're also including this area above the curve, and so it's not going to be an exact value for that area. But if we were to use more rectangles, let's say we let n equal to four, we could get a better approximation of that area because then we'd have rectangles that look like this. We'd have one here, then one here, then another one right here, and then one more over here. And so now notice when we use four rectangles rather than two, that the area of these rectangles added up together is going to be a closer approximation of that actual area because we're not including some of that space above the function that we were when we were only using two rectangles, right? Notice that this area right in here and over here is not included now that we're using four rectangles, right? And so our approximation here would get even better with the more rectangles that we used. If we used eight rectangles, it would be an even better approximation because we'd be including even less of the area that these blue rectangles are including. If we went to 16 rectangles, we'd have an even better approximation. The more rectangles we use, the better our area approximation will be. And so the question is, if we look at n as it approaches infinity, what will the area under this curve be? And so that's where the idea of the limit definition of area comes from. Because in order to see what happens as a value approaches infinity, we're going to need to use a limit. And so what we're going to do is we're going to find the limit of this formula where n, our number of rectangles, approaches infinity. And so we'd have that the area is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals 1 to n of the function evaluated at x sub i times delta x. All right, and so now before I move any further into this problem, if you're not familiar with Riemann sums or even sigma notation, which is what we call this notation for the sum right here, if you're not familiar with those topics, feel free to check out those lesson videos. I'll have their thumbnails up here on the screen so you know what they look like, but the links for those videos will be in the description for you to check out if you're not familiar with those concepts. But if you are, then we'll move on with finding the area under this curve using the limit definition. All right, and so in order to evaluate this or to find the area under the curve as our number of rectangles n approaches infinity, we're going to have to recall what delta x and x sub i are equal to. And so let's start with x sub i. And so remember that x sub i represents the values of x where your rectangles are meeting with your function, right? So in our case here with this graph, notice that the upper right corner of each of our rectangles is what is touching the function. And so we call that approximating the area using right endpoints rather than using left endpoints because we could also find the area under this curve by connecting the upper left corner of our rectangles with the function. And so that would change kind of how this looks as well as the actual approximation value. It would be slightly different. However, when we use an infinite amount of rectangles or we are looking at what happens as the number of rectangles we use approaches infinity, that's not going to matter so much. The value is going to be the same whether we use right endpoints or left endpoints. And so for our values of x sub i, when we were using right endpoints, x sub i was equal to a plus delta x times i. And then for left endpoints, our values of x sub i were equal to a plus delta x times i minus one. And so notice that for right endpoints, finding the values of x sub i is a lot simpler. We just have a plus delta x times i. Whereas for left endpoints, 
we have a plus delta x times a quantity i minus one. And so we're just gonna be calculating the area using right endpoints in this case when we are finding the area using the limit definition. We're not gonna use left endpoints because using this definition of x sub i is going to make things more complicated and make these problems more difficult. And so since we would be getting the same answer either way, we are going to want to use the easier method. And so we're going to erase this formula of x sub i for left endpoints because we're not going to use it for this video. All right, and so now we're going to want to substitute x sub i for what it is equal to here when we're using right endpoints. But before we do that, we need to figure out what delta x is equal to because not only is it part of this sum, but it's also part of our calculation for x sub i. It's right here. And so we know that delta x is equal to b minus a divided by n. And so b and a correspond to the bounds of our interval right, so we'd have an interval from A to B. And so that means that A is going to be zero and B is going to be two. And so this would be equal to two minus zero divided by N, which is our number of rectangles, which in this case, we're looking to see as N approaches infinity. So we're not going to be plugging in a specific value of N, we're just going to have N because we're going to be looking at the limit as N approaches infinity. So we're not gonna to wanna to plug anything in for N. We're just going to keep it there. And so that means that delta x would be equal to two divided by n. And so now that we know what delta x is equal to, it's equal to two divided by n, we can plug that into our definition for x sub i, as well as the lower bound a from our interval, and we'll have that x sub i is going to be equal to zero, which is equal to a, plus two divided by n times i. And so if we simplify, this will be equal to two divided by n times i. Right, and so now we're not going to plug in any values of i in this case, because remember, we're not using a set number of rectangles anymore. We're looking at n, the number of rectangles, as it approaches infinity. And so unlike when we had four rectangles, where we'd have four values of x sub i, or when we had two rectangles, where we'd have two values of x sub i, but in this case, we're looking at an infinite number of rectangles, and so we're just going to leave that value of i alone. And so now we know what x sub i is equal to, and we know what delta x is equal to, and so we can substitute each of those values into our formula here to find the area under our curve using this limit as n approaches infinity. And so this will be equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum from i equals one to n of x sub i, which is this right here, two divided by n times i, plugged into our function, which is x cubed. So we're going to plug two divided by n times i into x cubed. So we're going to replace x with what x sub i is equal to. And so we're going to have two divided by n times i cubed and then multiply it by delta x, which we said is two divided by n. And so we'll have times two divided by n. And so now what we have here is a sum that we can try to solve. We have now created an equation or a formula that is going to find the area under this curve using an infinite amount of rectangles. All right, and so the next thing we're going to want to do is to solve this sum and find the limit of that sum. And so let's do that next. All right, so here's what we found so far. We have our limit definition of the area under the curve, and then we have our values of x sub i and delta x plugged into this formula. And so what's the first thing you think you'd want to do to solve this sum? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is pull out everything out of our sum that isn't dealing with i, right? Because when we're looking at a sum, we're just worried about plugging in values for i. And so we're gonna wanna pull out anything else that isn't dealing with i, like this quantity right here, two divided by n. And so I'll rewrite the limit. We'll have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of two divided by n times the sum of i equals one to n of two divided by n times i cubed. Right, all I did was pull this 2n to the outside of the sum right here, but still within the limit. We can't pull it outside of the limit because we're looking at the limit as n approaches infinity. So this needs to stay inside the limit because it has an n in that denominator. But now the next thing we're going to want to do is to cube everything within this quantity for our sum. And so if we do that, we'll have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of two divided by n times the sum from i equals one to n of two cubed divided by n cubed times i cubed. And so now what do you notice about our sum now? Well, just like we moved out this two divided by n to the outside of that sum, notice that we have another quantity here 
that isn't dealing with i. We have 2 cubed divided by n cubed, and so let's pull that outside as well, because neither of these two terms have an i in them. We just have this i cubed that is being multiplied by this quantity, so we're allowed to pull this out. So we'll have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 divided by n times 2 cubed, which is 8 divided by n cubed, times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i cubed. Right, so we pulled this quantity to the outside of the sum, but not outside the limit, and we also cubed 2, which is equal to 8. And so now if we simplify this a little bit, we can multiply 2 times 8 and n times n cubed, and we will have the following, that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 16 divided by n to the fourth power times the sum from i equals 1 to n of i cubed. And so now here's where our knowledge of summations and sigma notation is going to come into play. If you recall, we have a formula for the sum from 1 to n of i cubed. And that formula is that if we have the sum from i equals 1 to n of i cubed, it's equal to n squared times n plus 1 squared divided by 4. And so we can substitute this formula in for this sum in our limit right here. And if you're not familiar with this formula, again, feel free to check out our lesson video on summation and sigma notation. That will be linked in the description. But then if we go back to our problem here and we substitute this formula in for the sum, we'll have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 16 divided by n to the fourth power times n squared times n plus 1 squared divided by 4. Right, previously when we used this formula, we actually plugged in a value of n from our sum into this formula, but in this case, n is approaching infinity, and so we're just going to use that actual formula with n, and we're not plugging in any specific value for n. We're just looking at n as it approaches infinity. And so now we're gonna have this term multiplied by this term, and you'll notice that we have an n squared in the numerator and an n to the fourth power in the denominator over here, and so this n squared will be canceled out, and this n to the fourth power will become n squared, because we can reduce the numerator and the denominator by a factor of n squared. And then similarly, we have 16 in the numerator and 4 in the denominator, and we know that 16 divided by 4 is 4, and so this will become 4, and this will become 1. And so if we simplify, we'll have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity, of 4 divided by n squared times n plus 1 squared divided by 1. Right, we canceled out this n squared with two of the n's in the denominator here, so we had n to the fourth, but now we have n to the second power, and then we had 16 divided by 4 is 4, and so now we can simplify this again, and we'll have that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of 4 times n plus 1 squared divided by n squared. And so if I erase this formula down here, we can move on to our next step by pulling out this 4 and then squaring this quantity, right? So we'll have this is equal to 4 times the limit as n approaches infinity. We can always pull out a constant to the outside of a limit like we just did there. And then if we square this quantity of n plus 1, that would be the same as multiplying n plus 1 times n plus 1. And so that would be equal to n times n, which would be n squared, and then n times 1, which would be plus n, and then we'd have 1 times n, which would also be n, and then we'd have 1 times 1, which would be 1. And so then we could combine our like terms here, and this would be equal to n squared plus 2n plus 1, and so we can replace this quantity squared with this quadratic right here. And so we'll have n squared plus 2n plus 1 divided by n squared, right? So all we did was we pulled out this 4 to the outside of the limit and then squared this quantity, n plus 1, to get these three terms, and it's still divided by n squared, which we have right here. And so now if we clean up our work, then we can move into our next step, which would be to split up this quantity into three separate terms. And so what we're going to do is we're going to divide each of these terms in our numerator by the denominator and split them up. So we're going to have that this is equal to 4 times the limit as n approaches infinity of n squared divided by n squared plus 2n divided by n squared plus 1 divided by n squared. 
right? So all we did was we divided each one of these terms by n squared, which they already are being divided by, but split it up into three separate terms. And so if we simplify, this will be equal to four times the limit as n approaches infinity of one, right? Because n squared divided by n squared would be one. We have a term divided by itself, and then we'll have plus 2n divided by n squared. We have a common factor of n in the numerator and the denominator. So that's going to cancel out. And so you're gonna have two divided by n plus one divided by n squared. And so we're almost done. The last thing we need to do now is to evaluate this limit for each of these terms. And so if we look at the limit for each of these terms, we know that the limit of a constant like one is just going to be the constant. But what about the limit of two divided by n and one divided by n squared? Well, remember the special limit that the limit as x approaches infinity of one divided by x is equal to zero and the limit as x approaches infinity of one divided by x squared is also equal to zero. And this is the case because as a value in the denominator gets larger, one divided by that increasing value of x or any fixed number divided by that increasing value of x is going to get smaller, right? The value of one divided by a value of x that is getting increasingly larger is going to approach zero. And the same would be true down here where we have one divided by x squared right, if that value of x is increasingly getting larger and then we're squaring it, it's still getting larger. And so one or any fixed number, it could be two, three or eight, doesn't matter, divided by an increasing value is going to get closer and closer to zero. And so if we look down here, we have the limit as n approaches infinity instead of x of two divided by n, a fixed number divided by an increasing value and one divided by n squared, another fixed value divided by an increasing value. And so in this case, we can say that this is just going to be equal to four times the limit of one, which is one, and then the limit of these two terms is just zero. So we have plus zero, plus zero. And so this would be equal to four times one, which is equal to four. And so that would be the area under the curve for our function f of x equals x cubed on the interval from zero to two, right? That is what we started with at the beginning of this video. So this value right here, four, is no longer an approximation. This is the exact value of the area under this function from zero to two. And so we found this area using this limit definition of area with the right endpoints of our rectangles where the number of those rectangles, n, was getting larger and larger towards infinity. And so if you wanted to, you could go back through and use this formula with left endpoints for x sub i, but it would be completely unnecessary and also very challenging. It would be a way harder calculation to do and you would get the same answer. And so once again, just wanna stress this, you're only going to want to use right endpoints when you use this formula. All right, and so then here's the equation that we used in this case. We found the area using the limit as n approaches infinity for a right Riemann sum, right? A Riemann sum that uses right endpoints with the number of rectangles n, where that n is approaching infinity. And that was equal to the sum from i equals one to n of f of x sub i, which this is the definition of x sub i for right endpoints, and then multiplied by delta x. And so this is the formula you are going to want to know to find the area under a curve using the limit definition of area. All right, and so that's all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more example problems where we find the area under a curve using the limit definition of area, feel free to check out our examples video that I'll have linked at the end of this video as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.